Okay, we will start the next session. So, uh, our speaker for the next session is uh, Laurent Baudet. Uh, thank you, Laurent, for accepting to give this talk. Um, okay, so so uh, Laurent is a uh, professor of physics and also the CEO and the co-founder of um, uh, a company called Lightwork, which uh, works on plant community models, especially I think for branch and audit. And uh, so yeah, thank you Laurent again for attempting to give this uh, lecture talk and please. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, well, first organizing this great workshop and then uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, to explain a bit the the journey we we've been through uh, at Lightan. So yes, uh, as uh, Saad was saying, uh, six years ago uh, I, I went on leave from my uh, job as professor at the university to uh, co-found on the start uh, Lightan. And uh, well, I, I'm going to tell you a bit the, the story, uh, the story behind it. Uh, so there are, there are two stories. The first story is the one we tell to investors. <laughs> so uh, the, so the, we are we are a spin-off from a uh, university research. Uh, we are four co-founders, uh, Igor and myself. We are uh, co-CEOs. Uh, yeah, Igor, maybe some of you know him from uh, the time he was blogging. He has he had a great blog called Nuit Blanche. About compressive sensing, complex sensing, uh, and that's actually how I knew him. Uh, and uh, we also have a uh, Florent, uh, who is now professor at EPFL, and uh, Sylvain, who is a professor at Sorbonne University uh, for the photonic part. Uh, we are a team of about twenty uh, in the center of Paris near Parc Montsouris, and uh, we are very international. Uh, so that's also one of the great. Uh, <laughs> But a great, great team, uh, very international, very, very nice. So what we do uh, actually is this uh, uh, foundation models. So um, maybe uh, language models, uh, they are called also foundation models, is like this new trend of uh, machine learning, new, like I would say since uh, GPT-3 or ChatGPT, uh, I hope many of you have tried the ChatGPT. If you haven't, you should. Uh, it's like, uh, to me, it, it keeps amazing me. Uh, you just write what you want, write a professional email to Tom Sanders, a salesman for a laser company, and then Bing, you click generate, and it writes an email that's uh, good English, but better than what I would have written myself. And then uh, it invents a way of using the laser. Uh, if you're not happy, you can ch change it. But uh, yeah, that's it just out of the box. Uh, you can do like, even uh, say, I want an Instagram, I want to post uh, I'm the manager of a hotel in the Philippines. I want to post something for this nice uh, for this nice hotel, and I want please the post should insist on the luxury on the diving because they, these are the, the highlights of my hotel. And then, Bing, uh, you click generate, and it would generate uh, this five liner that you can post directly on your Instagram. Uh, but uh, and you see, there's it's interesting because like uh, it has the diving uh, the thing like. Uh, there's no better way to enjoy your vacation with scuba diving. It's also luxury, but it, it it has not used the the word luxury. It has used luxurious uh, private villa. So it's not just a keyword matching, but it's more like a context and so on. So it's um, it, it really understands the context. So we we have this in uh, in English. We we did that also in in French. I'll come back to that later. So here I just took. Uh, a few lines from uh, an article in the uh, Le Figaro, uh, like a famous uh, business uh, newspaper. Uh, this is about real estate in Paris, so wh whatever. And then I, I click continue on it. The muse, uh, I mean, the, our, our model continued the text with exactly the same type of uh, style and content. It, it invents, uh, that, that's interesting because the first part quotes some expert. So the what DI has understood and also quotes some some experts that that don't exist. Uh, I check there is no Eric Legendre working working from uh, at AXA real estate. Uh, just, just that the model has invented uh, it and quoted this uh, 
so-called expert. Uh, so this is exactly the same type of thing. So yeah, uh, now there has been a chat GPT. So I said, uh, I, I, we, we ask a chat GPT, uh, three short bullet points for presentation on the power of large Norwegian model. So chat GPT, I, I should just sit in the audience and let chat GPT do the presentation for me because yeah, that's it. I mean, uh, chat GPT has already uh, summarized the, all the, the key points I wanted to, to say. Uh, the ability to understand and process NLP, uh, decision making in various industry, that's our, that's our important points. Uh, revolutionized industry, finance, healthcare, customer service, automating tasks, uh, personalized experience for customer. These are all important keywords. And I think this type of language model are going to change all this, uh, all this aspect uh, sooner that, than you, you, may, you may expect. So in more general, we, this, I mean, the, the key is transformer based, uh, you know, this architecture transformer that was already mentioned earlier, earlier this week in a very nice presentation. It's completely disrupting uh, office work uh, with yeah, GPT-3, chat GPT, code programming. Uh, we, we've seen already many examples, uh, drug discovery. We've seen a great presentation about AlphaFold. So there are these companies like, uh, of course, uh, DeepMind, or OpenAI doing amazing, amazing uh, discoveries in, in this. And it's also what's in, interesting is that uh, the, the time scale between scientific discovery or technical discovery and impact in the, in the real world uh, is uh, also shrunk. Uh, that's uh, already one year, one year after uh, GPT-3 was released. This number uh, is already one year old. There were hundreds of uh, startups building their business model around, around that. So it's really changing the economy uh, at a pace that I, I don't think we have seen that uh, any time in the history of uh, technology. The, the fact that the scientific uh, discovery one year later completely changed the economy. Well, to me, uh, to me, that's uh, really impressive. So it's, it's interesting because this this new AI is really, I mean, hard to build. Building a language model is hard. Uh, first, you have to collect uh, an insane amount of data to, to, train, uh, to train that. We call it a civilization scale because when I ask my engineer, uh, when we train the French model, uh, I ask, uh, do you prefer articles from uh, uh, scientific literature or, or books or... Uh, newspaper or web crawling, they say, I take everything. A a anything that you can find uh, will go in the data set. The more data you have, the better it is. Okay, provided it's high quality. Uh, so you want to avoid like crawling with all uh, uh, um, having like uh, offensive content or advertisement and so on, if you just do basic crawling, but then provided you filter this bad content, the more data you have, the better it is uh, for, your, for your model. So the day collecting and, uh, and training training is is hard. Uh, also, the software uh, also, as was discussed in a previous talk, uh, optimizing this code uh, it's really really a big computer problem. You you have to run uh, like. Uh, thousands, literally thousands of uh, GPUs at the same time in parallel with some uh, very, very tricky optimization in the, what they call 3D parallelism, uh, optimizing the code, the data, and the throughput, uh, optimizing everything. So it's really like hardcore computer science uh, problem for that. Um, and there are innovations every, like every week, literally. And uh, that's also interesting in terms of uh, hardware because it's, uh, you know, the, the new NVIDIA chips are really designed uh, with this application in mind. So this application really drives the new design of, of the chips and the, it's, going, it's going to be like that for, for a long time. So that's uh, really hard to build, but also easy to use. Uh, so the, all the effort we, we put in the pre-training of the model for, for the users, it makes it easier. Like, uh, as I said, there are hundreds of startups that just have to use the models as an API. Uh, and even you don't require any machine learning expertise to, to use that. You just have to, it's like building a web, uh, a web page. Uh, you integrate this uh, as an API. It's very easy to use. Uh, what's important compared to the previous uh, generation, I would say deep learning, is that you, <clears throat> they are called foundation models because they are not built with one task 
in view. They are, you build a language model and then uh, using, it, it, using it for one task, it's just a matter of uh, uh, like prompting or uh, fine tuning and so on, but the same model can be used for many tasks. Uh, and also, yes, it, what's also striking is that you interact uh, by writing English or French or Arabic, but uh, you, you, in, you use the model like you would talk to your colleague uh, uh, in natural language. Uh, so that's, that's really a different way of, uh, of programming. It's like what they call the low code or no code. Uh, so at Lighton, we, we develop and we commercialize some of these large language models that we, we have an edge compared to uh, like OpenAI, for instance, in the sense that we don't want to compete with them. That would be mad. They are super, super good, super smart, and uh, very wealthy as well. Uh, but so we train what we call natively. Uh, we, we train language model, language by language. For instance, for the French language model that we have, we only use French in the database. Uh, GPT-3 is mostly is built with, I don't know exactly, but maybe like 90% English and 10% uh, of other languages. So. GPT-3 can speak French or Arabic or any other language, uh, but it's not uh, the native language. So things like tokenization is made for the English, is optimized for the English language, and might not be optimal for the other language. So an, an alternative strategy, which is in some cases better, uh, I'm not saying it's always better, but it's in our cases, we can get smaller models with equivalent capacity uh, in specific languages. Like for instance, our model uh, in French and Arabic, there are about 10 billion parameters, which is uh, much less than the, the GPT-3 uh, that has 175 billion parameters. But uh, still in many use cases, we get similar performance and having a 10 billion parameter model is much easier to, uh, to scale the inference because you only need, need one GPU uh, and not like a full DGX uh, to, to run the model. So, Having a smaller model has some uh, strong benefits in terms of uh, scalability in terms of uh, the inference. So yes, we have this model. It's mo mostly the French model is really good. Uh, I think the Italian, Spanish, German, and English model are just so. So we we just uh, did that just to to train ourselves to get some uh, some ex experience on, on that. And, uh, but also we partnered with uh, TII in Abu Dhabi. To build uh, the new language model, yes. Can you expand a little bit on why especially with one language that lets you go from 135 million parameters to say 10 million parameters? Yes. Earlier on, you said that you uh, chat GPT is trying something like 90%, I guess it's a, it's a rough range. Yeah, 80%, 80 maybe, yes. So yeah. if you were to try and just on English, you would be removing just 10% of the data. Set. Yeah, or maybe 20%, Versus yes. You will be open to the data set to let you go from 175 million parameters to 10 million parameters. Why not? Do you do it? No. Like it's so yes. No, I, I think okay. there, there are two things to consider. The performance of a model is not just by the number of parameters. Uh, the number of parameters is one, one key element. Uh, but then the amount of training data uh, is also another, another parameter. So it's better to train. If you want, if you want to use a model in French, it's better to train a smaller model on more data uh, rather than than train a larger model on less data. That that's that's the trade-off. Uh, and uh, so yes, uh, to come back to to new uh, new the, is the uh, the I would say the first uh, ten billion parameter model in standard Arabic that we built jointly with uh, TI in Abu Dhabi, and I will uh, talk about uh, industry. I mean. Uh, uh, use cases for the uh, like business use cases tomorrow in the and have another another talk on the no actually uh, yeah that's uh, uh, I'll come I'll come back to that later but it's a very good good point so in this language model there are interesting things like first you only see the data once so it's also something that's very different from the previous generation in like uh, deep learning uh, on the, actually we have to spend a lot of effort we have seen that uh, if you do some web crawling uh, actually there are many repeats of the same contents 
So we spend a lot of effort in deduplicating the data set. And actually, it really improved the quality if you deduplicate. And it, I, I mean, I, I'm not answering your question. I, I'm, I'm aware, but it, it goes in, in the same same spirit. It's uh, you you the trade off compared to to deep learning are a bit different in in that sense. And there are these uh, scaling laws I'm, I'm going to talk about later, where you optimize the amount of data on the compute and uh, to to uh, to optimize performance. But uh, yeah, so deduplicating is a good, is an important thing. Um, yeah, so if you want to play uh, on on our models, there is no the Arabic model is not there yet. Uh, uh, it's going to be there at some point. Uh, but uh, TIA also has a playground. You you can I think it's Muse .ai I think the the no not Muse Nur. I think it's easy to find the, the, the playground of uh, for Noor on the, on the TIA website where you can play with the model. So I think when something is uh, has really happened in the uh, in the last few years. Is really in the uh, now AI has really entered the supercomputer uh, supercomputer world. Uh, so I think that's that's really a phase transition where you you could do the AI models uh, on your desktop computers, and now it's like forget it. You need a supercomputer to, to do this model. Uh, at that time, where OpenAI uh, partnered with Microsoft, uh, they built a branch of Azure. Uh, I think that was at that time the world's fifth largest uh, supercomputer. Uh, so that, that an insane uh, amount of uh, GPUs, like maybe 10,000 or 15,000, I don't know the exact number, but like. Uh, the size at which this AI is being done is uh, really at a scale that orders of magnitude larger than uh, what it used to be. So single G GPT-3 model, uh, 3 million GPU hours, it's been mentioned in the previous talk, uh, very big carbon footprint. Uh, okay, for the price, uh, there's some controversy about the exact price, but uh, the, the number I have is like a few million, uh, few million dollars. Uh, this is also something that, uh, uh, even uh, I mean, for universities, it's difficult to to catch up. Of course, uh, which university can uh, can spend that? Uh, so it's also an uh, an issue, and it's also, it's only the beginning. Uh, models get bigger and bigger. And why? Why do models get bigger and bigger? Uh, I, I'll tell you why. So it's important that the uh, these these models uh, they get bigger because uh, bigger is better in general. The more parameters you have. Uh, the more uh, like emerging properties like few shot learning and uh, zero shot learning and so on, they, they emerge after a certain size and they get better and better. Uh, of course, as I said, size is not the only parameter, also the training and the, there are many things to consider, but uh, really the capacity is, is linked, to, linked to the size. But at the same time, you, I mean, there is also a controversy whether Moore's flow is still alive or dead. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but uh, for sure, Moore's law uh, as an economic law uh, is dead. Uh, like a Moore's law, it used to be like uh, for the same amount of money, you would have a, a computer that's uh, twice as good if you wait uh, uh, like a certain amount of months, but it was for the same amount of money. Now, to go for the better chips, you have to pay more. So, uh, yeah, the, um, you, you, we still get better and better chips for sure. I mean, I'm still amazed at uh, what uh, Intel or NVIDIA or AMD are, are doing, but it's uh, they, they require technologies that are much more advanced, uh, like 3D stacking and so on. I mean, all these crazy technologies uh, that uh, that make it very difficult. And the, the gap between, uh, I would say, the, the need in compute and the supply uh, by chips is, is increasing in a way. Uh, at that time, uh, at, at some time, the the size of the largest model was doubling every three months, uh, which is uh, completely insane in terms of Moore's law. If you compare to uh, doubling every eighteen to twenty four months, uh, like the, the the exponential growth is much faster than any type of Moore's law. Uh, so uh, there is this thing with, with this language model that's called the scaling hypothesis. Um, and it's very much uh, debated in the in the community. It's uh, there is this uh, very nice paper called uh, "Scaling Law in Language Model" uh, that says that uh, 
you, you need to increase the model size. And that's it. That's, that's the sad truth. I mean, it's very sad because uh, <laughs> as a scientist, you, you, let's not think and uh, let's not do just brute force. Yes, brute force works. And that's, that's what it says. And uh, larger model, they score higher, they generalize better, they train faster. So if we look at this, uh, let, let's spend one minute just looking at this, uh, at this figure here. So on the x-axis, you got the compute budget that you have in a petaflop day. This is, this is how much budget you have. And uh, in the, the color scale is the number of parameters you have in your model. So it, it can go from uh, a million to a billion to 100 billion parameters. So it's like a six, uh, six order of magnitude. And uh, on the y-axis, uh, this is performance as measured by validation loss. So it's one measure of performance, of course, it's not a, uh, it's not the end task, but at least that's what you that's what you want. And you you see that all the curves they have this L shaped uh, type of uh, behavior, uh, where there is the the elbow uh, that's called the point of the optimality for a given point. The the point here is called the optimality point, where you get decreasing returns after this point. I mean, uh, there is one point where you you, you get uh, with some computation, you, you get very fast to good performance, to an okay performance, and then to get a better performance, then you, get, you need to spend much more. Uh, here, don't forget, the, we are on the log axis, uh, on the x-axis as well, right? So, it's, uh, uh, so here, this is the point of optimality. On all the optimality points, they all go on some line. Uh, it's a, it's, there are some empirical uh, lines, so because we are in a, in a log-log scale, there, there, it means there is some power law, and here is some exponent. Uh, I don't think there is a, a good reason why the exponent is, should be here 0 0.048, but anyway, this holds for, uh, like, uh, uh, as you can see here, like six, six order of magnitude. So this is very nice uh, because for the first time, I think in uh, computer science, you can make small scale experiments and you can predict uh, quite uh, accurately what will be the performance of your large scale model for a given compute budget. So if, say you have 1 million GPU hour in your compute budget, uh, you can design uh, the size of your uh, model and uh, you, you can say, I'm going to be optimal with this type of model. Uh, even though you only do small scale experiments, you can already predict like three orders of magnitude larger, which I think is really cool. Uh, and this is type of things that you you had in engineering, like in a heat transfer uh, for a long time ago. This uh, scaling laws, but I think this is a really a uh, really cool uh, a cool application of, of that. And uh, so th this was the first really uh, important paper. Now they have updated the scaling laws, so they are now a bit different. Uh, but still, the, the idea the idea is the same. So uh, as was already mentioned a few times. There has been an explosion of architecture for hardware because we need we need more computation. So we so uh, there is more than one hundred uh, projects uh, worldwide designing new chips, uh, either in the large companies or in small startups. Uh, and uh, yeah, we call it a Cambrian explosion. It's like, a, of course, uh, many will die, but uh, some some will will probably be the next generation chips. Uh, and uh, most of them are, of course, uh, around the pure silicon. I mean, the most crazy one is the Cerebras. I don't know if some of you saw the, the chip from Cerebras. It's like wafer scale chips. The, the chip is literally this size. <laughs> it's like uh, amazing. And, uh, but some of them also explore new physics, uh, like using uh, photonics uh, or, I mean, of course, there is quantum computing uh, that I'm, I will not mention too much here, but I, I'm mentioning. I'm only mentioning things that are like with applications like today, uh, quantum computing is maybe, I mean, it's like a joke. It's, it's always been like in, in 10 years time, we'll have quantum computers. So in 10 years time, we'll have quantum computers. Uh, it's like a, a, a constant, but, uh, but yeah, you, you, can use, you could use optics. And this is actually how Lighton actually started. So this is the second story, the alternate story, uh, it's like, a, when you have the first story to investor, you seem like you have the, a clear view on the domain and so on. Actually, uh, Lighton started with lots of uh, procrastination and lots of coffee. Uh, 
discussing with a lot of people and with absolutely no idea of having a startup company uh, to start with. Uh, it was just like we were all the four of us, the four co-founders, we were having discussion about uh, an experiment that was in Sylvain's lab uh, about computational imaging. So that was actually the, the experiment uh, on an optics table. And it was about how to use AI to improve uh, some uh, imaging techniques. Uh, so we were leveraging this, uh, actually this, uh, uh, this theory called compressive sensing and so on. Uh, and that, so that, that was it. Uh, we, 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 we use, uh, maybe some of you know the one pixel camera. Uh, that was a very good uh, uh, concept by Rice. So we do the alternate, uh, an alternate thing where you have the multi-pixel camera and we acquire all the pixels in parallel. So it's, a, it's like an alternate design for compressive sensing uh, using scattering material. And uh, we, uh, at some point, uh, we realized that uh, this laser and light scattering uh, um, method that I will describe later, and they perform some mathematical operations for free. Like physics does some operations that you can just, uh, well, first they are useful in, in practice for computing, and you can harvest this computation. Uh, like physics makes computation for free, and you can just, uh, leverage this computation to do to do that and that's when we said okay maybe maybe there is something interesting in terms of uh, patenting and uh, uh, gradually we yeah that, that's how we we came to the idea of maybe have a, a startup around that so what is what is uh, scattering just uh, this is like my one slide on physics <laughs> and that's it uh, so take a, a laser beam uh, on some uh, Scattering material, it could be like uh, uh, first, I mean, the experiment in Sylvain's lab, like here, maybe you, yeah, you cannot see, uh, but here he, Sylvain used literally uh, some white paint uh, that was coming from the DIY store uh, next door. So it, you take a slab of glass and you psh, you put some white paint and you, you make a, some very nice uh, scattering material. Uh, so it's a strongly scattering material, uh, as opposed to like frosted glass, where you only have a, a scattering at the surface. Here you have scattering in volume, and that's important to have here, scattering in volume. So by scattering, it means that you all the ray path uh, go into the, the material, and then they, there are these secondary sources, like in Huygens vision of uh, uh, photonics. And then on the screen, what you see is what's called a speckle. Speckle is well known to people doing uh, uh, like radar or people doing ultrasound and so on. This is just the interference uh, that could be constructive or destructive of these coherent waves. So sometimes the interference of all these sources is constructive and you have a bright point. But sometimes the interference is destructive depending on the phase and uh, you have a dark point. And that's a random pattern. And usually uh, people in uh, in imaging, like in radar or ultrasound, they want to reduce speckle. Speckle is, an, is a nuisance. They want, they want to reduce it because there is, they say there's no information in the speckle. Um, and so that's interesting. So what, uh, what uh, Sylvain was doing in his lab was trying to generalize that. So instead of uh, having a uniform beam, uh, you, you, you send an image, an image that carries information. An image is like, say, uh, one megabit, uh, like you have a one megapixel, uh, one megapixel image. So it's one megabit of information uh, if it's a binary uh, binary image. Uh, and, then, and then you sense it on a CMOS camera, again, uh, megabits uh, or megabytes of information on the other side. Uh, so it's like here, you, it's an image. And specialized modulators, they are typically the, the type of uh, devices you would get in video projector like this one. Uh, these are, you know, you uh, you put a, a digital data in, and uh, it it makes an image out of digital data, right? And actually, a CMOS sensor that's just the opposite. It takes an image and it makes digital data. So, uh, actually, if you see that, just as a physical system, as a uh, input output system, forget about the the physics. The, the only thing you have to, to keep in mind is that the, this uh, scattering is very complex because you've got scattering all over the place, but it's still linear. We were not talking about nonlinear non physics. The transmission is still linear. There is no nonlinear effect at this stage. We are at low power and so on. So because the, it's a linear system, 
there has to be a matrix that uh, that governs the input output you don't know it uh, i mean you can uh, you can you can sense it but you you don't know it but uh, there has to be a transmission matrix and because it's uh, this uh, scattering is uh, due to the random positioning of all these scatterers it's it's random and you can give some guarantees on the distribution it's uh, it's gaussian iid with i mean if you take care of uh, uh, certain optical uh, details you can make it gaussian iid this distribution so you know it, it's a system it's a black box where the input output is linear uh, it's a linear transform with a given uh, transfer matrix that where you don't know the indiv individual entries but you can guarantee that they are drawn from a gaussian iid distribution and uh, what you measure is the the output and actually there's a caveat is like you don't measure because h is a the electromagnetic field is complex valued uh, h is complex valued and you actually measure the intensity uh, so there is like the uh, uh, element wise uh, nonlinearity we you measure the uh, element wise uh, square modulus of of the of the field but uh, what's important to to realize is the size at, at which they happen. So, yes, it's one frequency. So it's a, it's a laser that's very narrow, uh, 532 nanometer, very narrow in, in frequency. That the, you can just refine that with, uh, Silva has done things with a multi, like wider laser and so on, but uh, this, this is like one frequency, very narrow. Uh, so what's, uh, what's really, uh, uh, here, different from uh, other computations, is really the size of it. Uh, really, you have say what, one million. Here, typically, you have one million pixel, even though you, there are some eight K uh, uh, so chips for eight K movie with thirty two million uh, pixels. So, like th this, uh, there are some commercial uh, chips that have millions of uh, input pixels. Or, or, or the other side, the CMOS sensor, like a sensor for smartphones and so on. Also, they they get to 10 millions, uh, million, 10 million, even 100 million uh, pixels. So actually the input output is really uh, incredibly large. Uh, it's like even with a very, very cheap uh, modulators and sensors, you can have a, a matrix of size 1 million by 1 million, uh, which is like 10 to the power of 12 independent random coefficients that you can access, you can read it, uh, for free uh, between quotes like it's like the, the uh, you you can you can do this multiplication the coefficients are fixed by design so this is really uh, it's a different computing concept it's like we, we've been used to uh, Feynman computing uh, in a sense that uh, uh, you multiply a and b and you get c but here the, the weights are fixed uh, so it's like a, a non Feynman computing uh, but it's uh, it's uh, actually useful in a number of cases. And in general, in machine learning, there is this uh, uh, very, uh, very nice uh, theorem that's called the Johnson in Strauss lemma that, uh, that tells you that uh, you can use the uh, random projection multiplying with fixed random weights with a good distribution as, okay, an easy way to see that is to compress the data. If you want to compress data, to compress high dimensional vectors, and you have no information about what you want to compress, of course, if you want to compress images, use a JPEG algorithm, and that works very well. If you want to compress sound, use MP3, it's great. If you want to compress videos, uh, use a specific, a specific compression uh, uh, algorithm designed for this type of signal. But if you don't know anything about your signal, you want a generic uh, signal compression algorithm, a very good way of doing that is using random matrices because random matrices, they preserve distances. So if you do, uh, if you want to do classification in the original domain, uh, two signals that are far apart in the original domain will be also far apart in the compressed domain. Two signals that are close will be close in the compressed domain using these random matrices. So and you, you can have mathematical guarantees on that. It's not just, uh, uh, not just a, uh, and waving argument like I'm doing, but it's uh, you can have you can do some strict uh, strict math on that. But you can do also the opposite. Instead of doing uh, compression, you can do expansion. So say your signal is in low dimensional, but then you want to do 
classification, but the boundary between your two classes is very twisted. You can do what's called a kernel trick. It's expand in large dimension, or like in infinite dimension. And then in the infinite dimension with kernel, it's much easier to find linear uh, hyperplanes that separate uh, your two classes. So embedding in larger dimensions is also something that can, you can do. So fundamentally, what we had invented is a machine that does this thing that's using physics. You do embeddings in low or higher dimension. That's it, uh, with very fast, very high dimension, and very low power consumption as well. That, that, that's it. So we, we, we took the lab experiment. And uh, after a lot of coffee and a lot of discussion, we, uh, and uh, also hiring a few people and very, very good engineer, we made it as a product. Uh, so it was, uh, we were, uh, yeah, at, at the time we released it, it was uh, really the first uh, on the market. Uh, so the, the number of uh, operations. So I, I, I'm still stressing the fact that they are not generic flops, so you cannot program the weight. Huh? So, so it's, the number is really, really impressive, but you cannot program the weight. It's, a, it's still a fixed, fixed weight. Uh, so the, the number of operations per watt is 200 times better than NVIDIA uh, when we really did the uh, top of the line. But uh, again, it's for a very, very restricted set. It, it can only do one thing. It does it very well but it can only do one thing. So it's not a one-to-one -one comparison with NVIDIA. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's, it's better than NVIDIA. And actually it's, we usually use it in tandem with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, GPU, uh, with GPU boards. Uh, so it's really the accelerator, another accelerator through the PCI Express uh, uh, lane. Uh, you have the host system that has a CPU. It has GPU to do if you do like a small scale uh, convolution for instance, but uh, we have a lot of small scale convolution, keep your GPU. It's great for that. It's really designed for that. So if you have to do large scale data compression, then you send the data to the optical processing unit. This is the same, uh, the same experiment. And then you get the result back. And we also put a lot of effort in the software side, like uh, to make an API that was uh, compliant with, uh, with uh, Python, PyTorch and so on. So you just have to, to uh, uh, to load the the good library and then you would you would be able to to do the commands that are also optimized with scikit-learn and uh, all, all the nice uh, the nice libraries so that it's for engineers who are familiar with the standard machine learning pipeline. It's just a matter of okay changing two commands and they uh, going to to use this machine. So the, the types of computations that you do. Can you do normal, let's say, normal convolution, normal, like normal, normal network layers, or you do the type of uh, computations that we showed earlier, where we just multiply by random matrix? Yes. So, so it's the computation that we do multiply by random matrix. Yes. So uh, this is exactly like my, this slide is some operation uh, in a complex, uh, uh, like machine learning data pipeline. Uh, most of the operation will be made on CPU or GPU. And just sometime you use the, here you know, we, we use the Lighton logo, just to explain where we use the optical uh, processing unit uh, in the pipe. So it may be sometime in the pre-processing of the data where you have a uh, high dimensional vectors and you want to compress them to do low dimensional signal and do the machine learning in the low dimensional signal. And sometimes it comes later in the chain. Uh, uh, so these are some examples. Uh, yeah, okay, another one in physics. Uh, uh, like with uh, David Russo, who is also working on the CERN data, and he tried that to classify events. Uh, there was a there was this talk uh, here about classifying events. Uh, uh, we can do some reinforcement learning where where we use this random projection to do uh, what's called locality sensitive hashing. So it's hashing two states to see which states were the, as close as possible, and to retrieve very fast. Uh, what was the past states that are as close as possible to the current state of the of the model? Uh, so we we played some classic Atari games <laughs> using the um, using the OPU. We have this uh, about time series uh, change point detection in high dimensional time series. So we use that for for numerical simulation on top of numerical simulation, or, or like here it's in COVID um, COVID protein. Uh, you can detect. In a high dimensional uh, time series, like here, it's in uh, two million dimensional time series, uh, like a 3D position of uh, 
700,000 uh, atoms. Uh, we can detect some uh, conformational changes in the molecule. Um, on the yes, and maybe the, maybe the last one are interesting. Like uh, that's here. It's uh, the two ones that have been done with in collaboration with Criteo or uh, Facebook AI research, uh, both in in Paris. Is like using this randomness on the fact that we do analog computing. Uh, uh, analog computing is low precision computing. Uh, typically, it has it has some noise. Usually, the, this noise is uh, it does not impact the end result. You can do some like six bit or eight bit computation, and that's fine for the inference. And so it doesn't impact the end result, but it has some beneficial properties as well for uh, say uh, differential privacy or uh, adversarial attacks. So the fact that you, because it's analog and noisy, you cannot fully characterize it, uh, and you cannot design the uh, the attack that will attack the system uh, for if you want to do adversarial attacks on the system. So it actually, what use what what could be seen as a as a drawback of the system, like it's it's low low precision and it has noise and so on. It's actually in some cases it's uh, it's interesting because you cannot by design you cannot attack it. This, uh, it, there is a built-in robustness that comes with the fact that it's uh, it's analog. Uh, so I think that was sort of uh, cute. This idea that uh, things that you you may see as a as a drawback actually, in some cases, uh, actually it could could be leveraged in a positive manner. Yeah. So your hardware is doing. A, you say that. The one thing that you have where there is some random projection. That's correct. But does the user choose the weight or are the weights embedded inside? They are embedded and they are given by the physics, but they don't change over time. They don't change over time. But can I train, use your hardware, train one machine, if I go to another one of your machines, do I end up with a different random? Uh, yes, you've got a similar distribution. Similar, but not the same one. Yeah, exactly. It's another draw of the same distribution. Yes, so I, I, very good point. I'll come back to that point later on uh, to see how we circumvent this uh, this, this thing. But you're you're correct. And again, this is this can be seen uh, as a as a drawback. But for robustness, there are some applications where actually uh, this model can only be run on this machine, and that's for uh, again adversarial uh, diffusion privacy and so on. This is an advantage. But but you're you're right. In general, this is a limitation of the of the thing. Okay, one more question. Of course. So so you have to interface with your machine and go back to the GPU machine that you need to go by the CPI. Is that the bottleneck? Because I yes, mean, yes, yes. It's always a bottleneck. Yeah. Okay. Your, your, your computation is actually a lot faster. So all the time spent on sending data, despite that, you can still get. Something. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So. Uh, 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 you, you're, you're perfectly right. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, of time spent. Uh, so you have to make sure it's only, uh, it only introduces some delay. Uh, delay is okay. Uh, so if you have the right pipeline, there's delay, but not, uh, it, it does not slow down too much the computation. So there are some, okay, some benchmark, you know, we all know, especially in the industry, that benchmark is always a bit of cherry picking. So this is this is my cherry picking of uh, of result. Uh, in the most favorable case, uh, I can have some very nice uh, speed ups. Uh, and again, it's nice. I have to stress that I'm not replacing GPUs. Huh? I'm comparing GPU only versus GPU plus or optical processing unit technology. So we are really working in tandem in some cases. And here, in that case, for the molecular dynamic case. I'm not comparing with GPU because we were running out of memory on the GPU. The thing with GPUs is that they have limited amount of memory uh, inside. So these this computation were so big that they did not fit into the GPU. So here the comparison is a CPU versus, uh, of course, CPU plus, uh, plus OPU uh, of light on. And I'm just going to, to give one more specific example about, uh, because it also refers to some of the previous talk. Uh, uh, but uh, a randomized numerical linear algebra, uh, which I think it's a very, very intriguing case. Uh, so linear algebra, of course, this is the, the mother of all science. Uh, everything, is, uh, everything is linear algebra uh, to start with. And uh, there was this very interesting uh, US report from the DOE uh, in the US 
saying that uh, this randomized algorithm are essential to the future of computational science on AI for science. So this is, okay, uh, wh why do they say that? And I mean, the DOE, they are running the largest supercomputer in the, in the, in the world. Uh, and yes, there are many problems that uh, just are too big. Uh, so either you do an approximate randomized computation or you, do, you don't do anything. For some problem, that's the only way to get some sort of uh, first result. So you, you do approximate, uh, approximate result, but at least you can scale to sizes that are not reachable uh, otherwise. So you can do uh, many things like, uh, uh, okay, we have a, a preliminary paper uh, you, can, you can find online. Uh, and I'm going to give uh, just one example, but it's just a toy example on please don't do it. Because it's a, it's a, just to understand the, what, what, it, what it is, but the results are really lousy. And the approximation is really bad, uh, but it's just to understand the, how, how it works. Uh, so imagine you want to multiply matrix A and B. On, okay, if you have a random matrix with uh, Gaussian entries, see here this, this uh, tall uh, matrix, uh, you, you have this R matrix with a random Gaussian entries, IID. You take R, R, R transpose here and uh, <laughs> you know that this is approximately the identity. It's approximately the identity, okay, the auto-correlation auto of white noise is uh, the Dirac function. Uh, I mean, there are many ways of seeing that, but for a random matrix, uh, if, you, if you multiply it by its, uh, by its transpose, it's approximately the identity, right? So, uh, so you can insert this, uh, this between A and B, and then instead of computing A times B, you compute AR, you compute R transpose B. So you compress A, you compress B, and then you multiply the two compressed version, right? So this is an approximation of your matrix matrix multiplication, very crude. Uh, but say now you have some hardware, oops, what, what's wrong? Whoop, complete crash. Okay. Sorry, uh, PowerPoint just crashed. There's so much light in the room. <laughs> yes. I don't, know where you, I don't want to send. Ah, okay. Let me, I have too much content. I, uh, I can just, I can just stop, stop here, maybe. <laughs> Okay, so no, no for sharing. No, there's a Zoom sharing that I have to set up again. I don't know. Zoom sharing doesn't seem to work. Do you see anything on Zoom? No. no. Yeah. But it doesn't see the second screen. No, uh, and then, is it this one? Uh, it is, this. Is that the right one? Yeah, I think that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, uh, my presentations are too large. I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I can finish with, uh, with other slides. No, no, that's fine. So, uh, yeah. Just uh, uh, we we can yeah 
there was this example of multiplying two matrices with randomized matrices. And, and um, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, sure, sure. Uh, so, okay, in, um, now you can do some more interesting stuff than uh, multiplying matrix by matrix because the approximation was bad, as I said. But here, the approximation is much better, is to do some trace estimation. Uh, again, linear algebra. Uh, for instance, if you want to do graph neural network, you have some, uh, you want to do some community detection in network, like in social network, for instance. Uh, you want to detect uh, uh, subgraphs that are completely connected, like communities in uh, like Facebook and so on. Uh, and one way of doing that is counting the triangles in a graph. And to count the triangles, I'm, I'm not expert, but uh, it uh, seems to be related to the number of, uh, yeah, not, counting the triangle is a hard problem. But you can approximate that with some trace estimation uh, of the adjacency matrix to the cubic value. Uh, so this is uh, uh, so here you do we, we do some tricks. Uh, so instead of uh, computing the trace of the cubic value of the adjacency matrix of the of the graph, uh, we we use this uh, uh, Hutchinson's trick where we put this random matrix and we compress, we compress this adjacency matrix and then we compute the trace of the compressed uh, adjacency matrix and we put it to the cube, which is of course much faster than, uh, you, you don't want to compute the adjacency matrix to the cube uh, for very, very large graph. So uh, the, the savings in computation is really, really large in that case. And here you can see that with, even with compressing by a factor of four, which is a uh, yeah the speed up is uh, uh, to the cube so you uh, so you have a potentially a time sixty four on speed up uh, but you only have a ten percent loss in accuracy so for sixty four times speed up here ten percent loss in accuracy it's a, it's all trade off yes. <laughs> Uh, here, R is a, is a random matrix. What does it mean, almost equal with the hash? Um, it, it means it's an approximation with some guarantees. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, so, so uh, I, I'm I'm not sure about the detail. To be to be honest, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But uh, but it it must be in expectations. But I I don't know exactly. I I'm not sure exactly what are the exact uh, exact equivalents between the two. Yeah. But you but you but you. Uh, yeah, and you can do the same with a singular value decomposition. Say you want to do the SVD of a matrix, uh, you put it in, uh, in your favorite like MATLAB and so on, and it says out of memory, it's too large. So what you do is the same. Uh, you randomize the matrix by, uh, you shrink in the largest dimension uh, using this randomized matrix. You do the SVD of the compressed, uh, of the compressed matrix. And then you, you get some approximation and you get some bounds as well. Like a, you approximate it, but it's a control approximation where you can bound the error that you, that you do. And here you can use it uh, for instance in industrial application or there are many applications of, uh, of SVD, but this is a very uh, easy way of dealing with a very large matrices. So if you're able to, to shrink with, uh, with random matrices and so on. So I'm, I'm just, I'm going to, to maybe skip this, uh, skip this uh, last part and just jump to the conclusion. This last part is, uh, can we use, uh, because I had, I started with large language models and then uh, my journey uh, uh, talked us uh, to, to optical processing unit and so on. So can we come back to the language model? And the, the answer is, I don't know, <laughs> but we, we tried to find out by, by putting the OPU in, a, in one of France's largest supercomputer, which is a Jean Zé. This is a supercomputer of the CNRS. So if you go to Jean Zé, you see hop, on, a, on an experimental node, we got one of our machine here. And that's the one here. 
and uh, we we are still working on that. Uh, so <laughs> the result is like a bubble is like the first iteration. The model, you see, it doesn't make any sense. The the text that is being produced completely uh, nonsense. But the grammar is more or less right. So it's very very funny because it's uh, like what this language model learned in the first iteration is learning the grammar and the structure of the language. But it's complete complete nonsense. But uh, it's, I think I think it's very funny. Um, anyway, what we the way we try to do it is to replace backpropagation by some algorithm where we use the random projection only in the backward pass. Uh, so that that maybe that answers the question about. Uh, do we need a, a, an optical processing unit uh, also for the uh, for the inference? In that case, no. Uh, we only use the optical processing unit uh, in the backward pass. So once the model is trained, we can we can use it. The forward pass is still made on a GPU or a series of GPUs, and so you can deploy it uh, and scale it anywhere. Uh, but this, this is still a work in a work in progress, and we still don't know where. We're still having problems scaling to very large problems. We, we're trying a 50 million parameter model, uh, which is very, very small for this language model. And we, we still struggle to, to scale up. So by way of conclusion, uh, yeah, the twisted course of a tech startup, we, we started with a component and uh, uh, this photonic hardware thing. Uh, and then, OK, climbing up the value ladder, as, as they say, uh, we try to design a system that's both like with the AI uh, so, so software and phonetic hardware. And then there was this language model. Again, we could climb up much faster or much higher with this language model. That's really the big hype at the moment. And it decouples the hardware and the software. Now we, we still do uh, the software, we still do the hardware, but more internal R&D. And uh, the speed at which these two go is uh, completely different. Like, you know, there's one that goes very fast and there's one uh, that's go, uh, much slower on the time scale of hardware, but you know, in the tail, uh, the hair, the hair on the turtle, I don't know. At the end, at the end, maybe uh, the hair doesn't win. So we'll, we'll see at the end. And uh, I stop here uh, with this uh, quote by uh, Sarah Hooker with this, uh, uh, in this paper called the Hardware Lottery, how does tooling choose which research ideas success, succeed and fail? And I, that's my concluding talk. Hardware is really uh, the key of uh, thinking uh, how uh, research should proceed as well. Thank you. Thank you all for the great uh, presentations and valuable questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, the yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yes. I mean, the, this randomized numerical linear algebra, this is not AI per se. This is just a linear algebra, right? So, it's, uh, of course, uh, as I said, we, that's the story we tell, we tell to investors that we are an AI company, but uh, because they like it. Your yeah, we have some research ideas about how to control the thing, but it's at, at this stage is very much like research ideas. So it's not it, we have not reached maturity so that it could become a feature of a product. But we have some ideas on how to control the things. At the moment, just some ideas. The matrix is different between different devices. That's correct, yes. Okay, but you can measure it by the Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can measure it. Like, if you do calibration sufficient input output, you just uh, invert uh, the matrix and you can you, you can know it. Yeah. On the side where you have an input vector, a matrix, and an output vector, the output vector has the same dimension as the input. And then you just copy it. So yes, yes, exa exactly, exactly. We can truncate, we can truncate the input. If you want to expand the dimensionality, we truncate the input. We only take a sub part of the pixel, or we can truncate the output. Yes, exactly. It's just a matter of truncating. No, the, input should... the, the, the input is the size of your input vector. Sometimes it's less, much less than a one million. And does the uh, random matrix 
So we, we, we designed it in such a way that it doesn't change over time. So it means it has to be stabilized, especially like temperature stabilized, uh, because uh, you know it's uh, yeah you don't want the if you get a big temperature shift like your your scatters will uh, uh, will be more separated. Uh, we, we, there will be some dilation dilatation of the material, uh, so it would change the yes. So we we design it with temperature control so that it doesn't change over time. Over I mean weeks, maybe months. I'm not guaranteeing over years, but uh, weeks, weeks or months, it's it's guaranteed. Yeah, yeah but you, you still want to, uh, if you have trained your model uh, once, you still want the same model to be, uh, to be valid uh, a month later. Yes, you mentioned noise at some point. So uh, how does that enter into the picture? Are the wires actually not close from noise? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. We, there's always some noise because uh, it's analog hardware. And so even, uh, even the dark, what's called the dark noise, and like if if you have a CMOS sensor, like the one you have on your cell phone, uh, even in complete dark, uh, the pixel will still uh, output some uh, maybe low random values, even due to quantum fluctuation and so on. So there is there will always be some some noise. Uh, we estimate that we have about uh, uh, so the output is on eight bit and maybe. Six six bits are really information, and the, the least significant two bits maybe are, are probably in noise. But six bit is it's okay for this type of computation. Um, you you cannot avoid it really. I mean, you can do as much as you as you want to lower this this noise, but. Uh, What are your thoughts on uh, multiplexing these operations over different frequencies? Because in theory, you would be yes, yeah, yes, many uh, 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 Absolutely, we we could do that, and Sylvain has done that uh, in his lab. The thing is, as it was already mentioned, we are more like bottleneck by the data throughput through the PCI Express thing. So it, it would be a way of increasing the computational capacity of the device itself, but uh, it doesn't solve uh, the the bottleneck that is, that is the data throughput that's a, that's a big bottleneck at the moment so yes we can do that we can multiplex over several frequencies we would need high, like hyperspectral cameras and so on that would be much more expensive the device everything would be much more expensive <laughs> uh, in theory it's doable in practice the the benefit is not so clear can you follow up to the noise have you looked at the time averaging if you say this is the development of io yeah, 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 I mean, there, there are many, many ways of uh, of reducing the noises, but yeah, so far, this noise has not been so much of a problem. So, and so you also had the FPGA there, so the PCI, was it the FPGA? Yeah, yeah, the FPGA is for data communication on the, uh, like, pre- and post-processing of the, of the data. What if you had to keep the sheet and the FPGA, do you have a lot of PCI? No, 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 no. They are, they are just uh, custom, custom, custom links. Uh, so, okay. yeah. so could you, the FPGA is very program member, so could you put some compute on the FPGA so that, you know, you have a much faster communication, let's say if you wanted to have a random projection followed by some nonlinearity or something like that. And then yes, 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 we, yeah, exactly, exactly. We could, we could design exactly some, uh, for very specific application, uh, we could design some, uh, just as you say, so, so some times where the, the computation would, would stay in the optical processing unit on the FPGA. The FPGA also has some CPU cores uh, embedded. So yes, there are many things we could do. We designed it to be as generic as possible. So that's not uh, the, the path we chose, but uh, of course for some specific applications, yes. Yes. Not not at the billion size, but at the million size. Yes, but uh, yes, yes. Uh, that's what we did for the reinforcement learning type of uh, uh, for thing. The thing is. Uh, uh, 
I think it would, it, it's a possible application, but uh, you're, uh, you're competing with a very optimized uh, retrieval algorithm. And uh, so I, I'm not sure it, it's, a, it's a low hanging fruit. It, it might be possible, but uh, it's definitely not a low hanging fruit. Question just for instance, maybe to just start with the alpha. So for, for the news model and the new model, for, for you using the photonic uh, computation model? No, no, no. I, I said we, for the photonic computation, we only did it uh, for like 50 million parameter model. That's the max we, we achieved. So for the commercial model, we are 10 billion parameters. So like three orders of magnitude larger. And we do it on a I, I, I was about to say standard computing on supercomputers, which is not quite standard computing. It's like already 500 GPUs for several weeks. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's we use GPU on the silicon.